kind. Amen. You can always tell the spirit of a man by what he says about Christ. And how, do you, how do you know that? Because the Holy Ghost is in here to glorify Christ. Amen. Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 17 with me this morning, please. 1 Kings 17 and verse number 1. Just, just so you'll know, the Bible I hold in front of me, I believe from cover to cover. Amen. I do, I do. I believe every word of it. It's the, uh, the old kicked around, stomp, maligned KJV. But I believe it, folks. I believe it. First Kings chapter 17 and verse number 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Father, bless this holy book now as it goes forth. Let me stand in the office and do what you've called me to do, Father, as the messenger. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Now, Elijah did not write books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah and Hosea and Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and Nahum, so forth. Elijah was a prophet in every sense of the word as much as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Isaiah was a prophet that showed up from nowhere to this very day. There's a lot of controversy as to where he came from because some say they've found Tish and others say they haven't. I'll leave that alone, but the bottom line is he's a mystery person. Elijah had a specific reason for being here, and when it was finished, he was finished. And God took him from this earth unlike anyone that had ever lived before him or since. Elijah's a unique character, therefore. He is the antitype of John the Baptist in the New Testament. John the Baptist could have been Elijah. According to the book of Malachi chapter number 4, it says that I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Elijah was prophesied, notice carefully now, he'd already lived his life. He'd been caught up in a, in a whirlwind, in a chariot of fire, into the heavens. And yet God prophesied in Malachi that he's going to show up again. He said, I'll send you Elijah the prophet. But when John the Baptist showed up, Matthew chapter 17, the Lord made it very clear to them that John the Baptist could have been Elijah. Which, of course, adds something to the study of the New Testament, which should intrigue your soul. And that is that something profound could have changed in the New Testament. And the New Testament would not have been anything like it is now. Because God is able to raise up of these stones words that praise the Almighty. He can do as he pleases. He that sitteth in the heavens can put Nebuchadnezzar on his feet in the field. Let him eat grass like an ox for seven years. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So when he called Elijah forth, he called him to bring Israel back to God. Elijah was quite a man. He really was. I don't know if one before him or one since him that was like him. But we know this about Elijah. He was associated with fire. He's called the prophet of fire. Elijah is quite a unique individual in that sense because fire is going to be used in the tribulation period by the Antichrist prophet who's going to call fire down from heaven. And Elijah shows up in Revelation chapter number 11, if you believe that's Elijah, one of his two witnesses, and I believe it is. I believe it's Elijah and Moses. And the Bible says fire will proceed forth from his mouth, the mouth of Elijah. And he will prophesy for over three years, and they can't do a thing to him. He comes, therefore, to call Israel back to God. That's why he came the first time. That's why he'll come the second time. It's a good message to preach the second coming of Elijah. That opens up an awful lot of New Testament doctrine. Now it's important to understand that the Bible, folks, is written on many different levels. It's written in milk for those who have just been born again. It's for you. There are much, there's much in the Bible that you need to read. Now if you just got saved, God's word will feed you and you can take his word and assimilate it into your soul and grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. But the Bible is also written on an intermediate level. For those of you that have begun to pass the milk and you're beginning to study a little deeper into God's Word, and you'll find that God's Word is quite a remarkable thing. For the many passages that you have read in the past when you first got saved and meant nothing to you have now begun to open 
And you're beginning to see patterns and messages and types in Scripture you didn't see before. Then the Bible is written on a higher, much higher level than that. It's written on a level to where if you spent your entire life studying the Word of God, 50 years, 70 years, you will not exhaust its riches. Don't ever let a man stand up in front of you and through his arrogance and ignorance tell you he's a master of the Bible. That does not exist. For one thing, the Bible is a living book. Amen. It's alive. It speaks to every generation. You're in a generation 2023, passing almost into 2024. There's a message for today that was not preached in 1950 because it wasn't needed in 1950, but it's needed today. So the Bible comes alive for those of us who are alive today. And what we need to do is to seek the face of God. God will send us an Elijah when we need him. And he will show up. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it is the prophet himself. It could be someone else that God sends instead of that prophet. So he's a prophet of fire, surrounded by mystery. Nobody knows where he came from. And the truth of the matter is that when Elijah and Enoch left this world, Enoch was simply transferred, changed in a moment, and carried up into the presence of the Lord. Did Enoch die? The Bible didn't say he died. You know why? Because he becomes a type of us. Those of us sitting in this house today. The thing that excites me this morning is the fact that I may never walk out that back door again. I may never see that car again. I may never see my house again. I may never see it all of a sudden. I can be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah to God. If that doesn't fire up your soul, I don't know what will. We look for the coming of the Lord. Enoch, Enoch therefore, before the judgment, is the type of the church. But who is Elijah? Caught up in a whirlwind, a tornado, and up it carried him, but in chariots of fire. Later on in that same uh, First and Second Kings, we find Elisha, his, uh, his, his, his uh, successor. Elisha was in a building, and a man was in there with him. And Elisha knew about the chariot of fire because he saw Elijah caught up in it. And he said, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. And the hills were covered with the horses, horses of fire. Everywhere you could see. Oh, preacher, do you believe that? Look, my dear friend, this morning with an eye of faith and you'll be amazed at what you can see. How do you know that the chariots of fire aren't surrounding this building right now and all hell would like to take you down? Make no mistake about it. This is 2023 and this outfit that's in this world, in this country right now, hates you with a pure hatred. And he that letteth will let to be taken out of the way. So that one that keeps them from being able to overrun you, destroy you, tear down his church, will never do it till the Lord Jesus Christ comes and says, come up hither. Upon this rock I build my kingdom and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Is that right? I'm not a kingdom builder. If you're listening to a kingdom builder, turn him off and find somebody that talks about him building his church. The Lord Jesus builds his church, not his kingdom. The kingdom of God cometh without observation. If you've been born of the Spirit of God, immediately you go into the kingdom of God. I didn't build it. Neither did you. Neither could any man do that. Let me get back my message, amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> I enjoyed it, though, while it lasted. Hallelujah to God. I don't know about you. I caught that. I almost got that rabbit, brethren. That took off, and I went out after it. <laughs> amen. <laughs> he shows up at the Mount of Transfiguration and again in the Tribulation. My dear friend, this is Elijah. Look for him. Revelation 13 says, And he doeth great wonder, so he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of God. It came to pass as they went on and talked. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and carried Elijah up from this earth. Now, I don't know what happened. Maybe he said something. Who knows? But I know while he was going up, something came down. Elijah was being caught out of this world, but he left something behind. And do you know what that was? That was that hairy thing he carried around his shoulder. It was that mantle of the prophet, and it came falling down. And you know what happened? Elisha was there waiting for it, and he grabbed it. And he went to the Jordan River, and he said, Where's the God of Elijah? And smoked that water. And my dear friend, the God of Elijah showed up and cut it in sunder. Elisha, therefore, was without question anointed as the successor of Elijah the prophet. 
The Bible tells us in 1 Kings 18 that Elijah gathered the prophets of Baal to Carmel. Now, Carmel is a mountain range, folks, a range, not just one mountain, but a whole range. And if you follow it on down, lo and behold, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find Megiddo. You're going to find Megiddo. What is Megiddo? Megiddo is the location of the final battle between God and the armies of hell. It's called in the, the book of Revelation, they gather together to Armageddon. R in Hebrew means mountain of Megiddo. R is mountain of Megiddo. So it's an amazing thing that there on top of that mountain of Carmel, God showed Israel who God was. Amen. Think about that. And there at Megiddo, he's going to show them again who God is. He's blinded them now, but he's coming back to the children of Israel. If you notice in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 36, when God Almighty shows up on top of Carmel, he does something that's quite remarkable, and you need to know the timing of it. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 36, Elijah called the fire of God down from heaven. Then in verse number 36, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant that I've done all the things of thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones, the dust, and licked up the water. That was in the trench. What time? About three o'clock in the afternoon. Why is that important? It was at three o'clock in the afternoon that the Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It was at three o'clock in the afternoon, the time of the evening sacrifice, my dear friend, that heaven was satisfied. It was then that the fire of God fell upon his own son. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. It was the Lord Jesus Christ hanging upon that cross at three o'clock in the afternoon that God received from his son everything he needed to satisfy a holy God, to pay the sin debt that had to be paid, to bring my my friend, all mankind in accessibility to God to lay before him an open door so that you could be saved at three o'clock in the afternoon. The old timers 150 years ago used to sing songs about how that what Christ went through went much deeper than him dying physically upon the cross. That there was something going on inside his soul and his spirit that could not be seen with natural eyes, but it was much, much, much deeper in its suffering than simply physical death. And they used to talk about that from Hebrews chapter number 5 where the Bible said he feared and God heard him in that he feared and he answered his prayer in that he feared because the Lord Jesus Christ my dear friend was facing the wrath of almighty God. His son, not his son plus something else. His son took it all at the cross at Calvary. So therefore my dear friend he was a consuming fire. A message in itself, a separate, complete message would be, what did the father consume when he consumed his son? Don't you think about that? That's quite a thing. What did he consume when he consumed his son? Do you understand your sin? Do you understand death? Do you understand access to God? Do you understand justification, redemption, propitiation? Do you understand all these things were all wrapped up in one person? The Lord Jesus Christ, not him plus something, him nothing else. But Christ is the answer for every demand of the Old Testament law, for every righteousness that has ever existed, for every law that was ever made, for every death that will ever die. The Lord Jesus Christ is the answer to it. And without him, there is no answer to it. Amen. Every religion, everything is nothing but death without the Son of God. Man, oh, that the church would wake up today and understand that. We don't need anything any pagan religion has to offer. Amen, folks. Amen, amen, amen. And so, Elijah was the prophet of fire. But the Bible says that when Elijah introduced by fire into Almighty God, the fire fell at Carmel, and he watched the fire lick up the water. Elijah knew that God was a God of fire. Then he went off to a cave. There's a remarkable thing about this over here in 1 Kings. 
The Bible said God spoke to him twice. First time he spoke to Elijah, he said, now go stand on that mountain. Go up there and stand on that mountain. That was easy enough for him to understand, so he did. That was the first voice from him. But then he stood in the entrance to the cave. And I suppose he was expecting for that fire when it came by to speak to him again. But God's voice was not in the fire. It wasn't in the wind. It wasn't in the, my dear friend, anything that happened that day. God's voice came as a small, still voice. A still, small voice into the soul of Elijah. My dear friend, has God ever speaking, spoken to you in a small, still voice? Has he, ever, has he ever really spoken to you? How long has it been since you've heard from God? Really, how long has it been? How long has it been? I couldn't make it a week if I didn't hear from him. In the last couple of days, I've been wrestling around, but this morning, God Almighty began to speak again to me. Amen. And I thanked him so much for it. So how do you know? Well, I'm going to tell you what happens to me when God speaks to me. He opens up my soul, and the word begins to flood in. The word begins to flood in. One message right after another. I mean, a preacher couldn't ask for more than that. <laughs> I mean, here it comes. Spiritual truths, they just flood into your soul. That'll do more for me, 30 seconds of that'll do more for me than 30 revival meetings. 30 seconds of God coming into me, my presence like, that'll do more for me than any, any, any man-made religious setting on the face of this earth. Just that and that alone. So what is that small, still voice? First of all, it's the voice of who you are. He's talking to Elijah. Adam hid himself behind fig leaves when he hid from the Lord. Note carefully, fig leaves Adam hid himself behind. Did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ only cursed one thing while he was here on this earth? It was a fig tree. What is a fig tree? A fig tree is a representation of man's righteousness. He was hiding behind something. He was hiding from God. Are you hiding from him, dear friend? Don't hide from him. Don't run from him. For the first place, you're foolish if you think you can hide from him. And if you think you can run from him, you can't do it. Look, 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 Adam hit him. David said, who am I? Who am I? When that voice began to speak to David, he began to hear from God. He said, who am I? That you might raise me up to lead Israel. Who am I? And we have Paul who said, though I be nothing. In 2 Corinthians, I want to read it for you. I become a fool in glory, and for you've compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. And it was saying, Lord, I am what I am of the grace of God. It's not because some great gift I have. It's because you put your hand on me and you raised me up. And he said, I'm nothing. I would that some of these, some of these arrogant, pompous, I mean rare back preachers that make you think they're God's gift to humanity. How would they get on their face and realize once you're gone, son, you're gone and we'll go on like you were never here. Some of the, some of the Protestant popes are gone now and they think that these men that were their disciples, they think, what's the church going to do? It's going to do better. It'll get along fine without me. We need Christ, not men. But if you're a man follower today, you're already mad at me. The only way you're going to make it in the Christian life is to get your eyes of all, off of your Christian heroes and put them on the Lord Jesus Christ because your Christian heroes are going to let you down somewhere. There is not a Christian hero walking the face of this earth that you would want to watch 24-7 and they wouldn't want to watch you 24-7. Amen, folks. I don't want to be mean about it, but I'm telling you something. I'm nothing. I'm a messenger. I'm privileged. I, I'm blessed to be able to stand up here and open up God's word and preach to you. Did you know this man that said he's nothing wrote half the New Testament? <laughs> Abraham said, I'm dust and ashes. Connected himself with the earth and its curse. That's what he did. I'm dust and ashes. Job said, after an encounter with God, I loathe myself. Uh, Job, no, wait a minute, son. Let's get this straightened up. Job, you're all messed up. You need to love yourself, Job. <laughs> then you... You just need to fall in love with yourself, Joe. <laughs> Let me tell you boys that love yourselves. I want to talk to your wife a little while. <laughs> Amen. 
And you girls in here that are madly in love with your son, let me talk to your husband for a little bit. Amen. Flush that garbage down where it belongs. Job said, I loathe myself. And did you know that Job is mentioned as one of the three people in the Old Testament whose righteousness rose above all the rest of them? Amen. What about that? Noah, Do Noah, Job, and Daniel. Then ja Daniel, you know what he said? When God put his hand on him, you know what he said? Couldn't say anything. He just trembled. There's the voice of who you are. That's a still voice. Then there's the voice of your past. That's where you came from. What's happened to you? Have you been hurt in the church? Have you been in church a long time? Have you been going most of your life? Then you've been hurt. Have people disappointed you? Has anybody ever stabbed you in the back? Yeah. I mean, has it, have, have, things work, have, have things ever not working the way you wanted them to work? Have you ever, how many of you have ever met with a bald face? I mean, died in the wool. A number one hypocrite. Raise your hand. Good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Bigger crowd than I thought. <laughs> Got a lot of hypocrites running around. You know what the word hypocrite comes from? It's a Greek word, hypocritus. It means an actor. That's all it means, an actor. So therefore, a hypocrite is an actor. Well, don't let them drag you down. Don't let the hurt eat you up. Don't let the past destroy your future. Every one of us have to live through things like this. We all get hurt. We all get set back. We all run into problems. We all have this kind of thing we have to deal with. Some of these people that uh, you come to a church and you know them. You know these people outside the church. And yet you see the people in the church don't know any better. Well, leave them that way. Especially the young ones. Leave them alone. The young ones will grow in knowledge of the Lord. Amen. They'll grow. They'll grow, and as they grow, they'll learn how to deal with stuff like this. Yeah. Folks, when you walk through that back door right there, you walked into a house that's full of sinners. Some of them have been born again, and some of them haven't. Some of them have been on their face pleading the blood of Christ over their soul, and some of them have reared back in pompous pride, and they refuse to do that. Have you been hurt? Have you messed up? Have you complete wasted your life? I thank God to this morning because I know where I'd be every time I drive under a bridge. I think I could be under that bridge. There's a place over here coming off of the interstate next to, uh, I forget the name of the restaurant. It's off, coming down. And you look off to the bottom down there and hear all these tents and all this garbage piled up down there. I look at that and I think, good night, man. What do you think, preacher? Oh, what a sorry low down. No, no, no. I say to myself, these people, you know, how'd they get there? God can help them. The Lord could clean every bit of that up and change every life that's in there. Well, they need the Lord. Amen. Amen. They need the Lord. Amen. I pulled by someone the other day, and they were standing there, and I don't usually pay a whole lot of attention to a lot of things, but this one got my mind, got my eye. And I started trying to get my wallet. <laughs> I was going to give them a little money. And I swear, the first thing that happened, I had to go and traffic, and I couldn't get to them, and it bothered me. It bothered me. Did I tell you about the veteran in St. Augustine? I didn't tell you about him, did I? I walked down the old street in St. Augustine. Here sits a veteran, got no legs, got no legs. And, you know, see, they got, they got them all up and down the street, but they're not the same. This one, I looked into his face, and he looked right at me. He had, a, he had a look on his face like he's hurting. And that began to bother me. That bothered me. And I walked on down the street. We went and got a hamburger or something, turned around, and I reached in my pocket, and I pulled a $20 bill out. <laughs> so I'm going to help this guy. I can't stand this. I can't stand it. And I headed back, but he was gone. By the time I got there, he was gone. But that ate me alive. That bothered me. How do you feel about that? Huh? Come on, think about it. I could be there. I mean, I could be there, folks. You could be there. If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Something could happen to you that could just knock the socks off of you and your whole life get turned upside down. Oh, I grieved over that. That bothered me. I thought, oh, what happened to him? Because I wanted to help him. I wanted to help him. God knows I wanted to help him, but I let it get by me. Here's why people cannot help you, okay? I'll give you a few things and I'll come to a close today. They're too proud. They won't be seen with you. The crowd they run with is on a much higher level. 
We got churches around us who take a higher level than we do. Hogwash. I know there are kids that have been to their schools and some of them are sorry and low down and worse than public school kids ever thought of being. How many agree with that? Yeah, but does that mean that what they're doing is bad? No, no. Face the reality of this. Kids, if you go to a Christian school, it's good. That's a good thing. But going to a Christian school does not make you better than anybody and it does not make you a Christian. You have to make that choice yourself. You have to make your own decisions. You have to make your own choices. But they're proud. They're proud. They won't be seen with some people. Let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ was seen with some of the sorriest low-down garbage on the face of this earth. They called him a friend of sinners. They did. They did. Here's why a lot of people can't help you. They're too fearful. They're afraid of what somebody would say, scared to death of this, scared to death of that. You live a life of fear. You don't, you're, not, you're, not, you're not interested in what God thinks about it. You're, you're interested in what people think about it. Folks, if, you, if, if you're going to live your Christian life worrying about what people think about you, you might as well hang it up now. You're not, you're not going to make it. They're too immature. A lot of them are immature. When I first got saved, I, I, I mean, I had a repertoire against sin. You better believe it, buddy. I'd go to war against sin every time I got in the pulpit. I mean, I went to war. But the problem is, there's more to it than going to war against sin. What is it? The whole counsel of God. Everybody in this house is not here for the same reason. Some of you came in here and you just buried a loved one, a mother. Or you've got a loved one that's sick and they're dying right now. You've got a marriage that's fallen apart. Or you have a child that's in rebellion to you. You have a husband or a wife that you just found out has been, uh, has been sneaking around on you and fornicating. You've got every kind of the thing that happens in the world. It goes on in the church houses. Sure it does. I'm not going to get up here and make a fool out of ourselves. And this is where you are this morning. You've been stabbed in the back. Your throat's been cut. You're in here today. You're all in here for different reasons. You have different problems. And so for the preacher to think, well, I'm going to just go, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to preach that. No, no, just let God speak to your soul. Because somebody can get something from what you say. First mark of an immature Christian is self, 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 self. Me, 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 me. Here's another reason why they can't help you. They're too ignorant. They live in la-la land. I had a preacher say one time, a long time ago, he said, when I first got saved, I went to a church. He said, I thought all those people sitting around me were saints. I could feel the wings. I could see, I could see the glistening of the halos. I couldn't imagine anything like what I began to find out. And, of course, what did he find out? He found out they're just like everybody else. What you should do when you find out that you, that old man is still the old man is to learn to get on your knees and get right with God. Bring him before the Lord. Crucify him. Put him to death. It's the only thing you can do. And then some are too wicked. Too wicked. Too godless. There may be somebody in here right now. You've got, a, you've got an affair going on on your wife. You're sneaking around. You're hiding. Some of you may sit in this house this morning. You may have pornography on your computer. You may be sneaking around watching that stuff. Or some of the women doing the same thing, affairs, pornography, all that garbage. Some of you have fallen down drunk every day of your life. Some of you doped up. This, that, this, that, this, that. Well, my dear friend, the sin itself is not what makes you wicked. Did you hear me now? Listen carefully. The sin is not what makes you wicked. It's the way you handle it. That's what makes you wicked. When you start making excuses for it. When you try to hide behind it. You know how you hide behind sin? Here's how you hide behind sin. Everybody's doing it. See, you're hiding behind it. You want to accept responsibility for what you're doing. Are you in that? Are you doing that? You got pornography going on your computer? Are you in an affair? When we give an altar call in a minute, you ought to come down here and get on your face. You don't have to tell somebody you're in an affair. No, 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 no. You don't have to tell them you got pornography on your computer. But what you ought to do is come down here and bring it before the Lord and confess it to him. Because let me tell you something about pornography. The latest statistics to come out say that half the men in the churches today are hooked on pornography. Now, would you believe that? Yep. Well, is Temple Baptist Church part of that? Does that mean half the men in this house this morning, you've, you've had a dose of pornography all week long? Think about it. Well, I'll just turn it off. Can you really? It's not that easy, is it? You're hooked on it. 
You know why? Because it appeals to your flesh. And the flesh is never satisfied. Man, it's quiet in here. Lord, have mercy. Help us. Time to have prayer beating. <laughs> I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. Let me tell you something about it. Let me tell you what pornography is going to do to your marriage. It's going to destroy it. I've seen it destroy it. I'm a veteran pastor. I have seen pornography bust up and destroy a young marriage. I've watched it happen. I've seen it right here in this church. I've seen it happen. And it can happen to you. Well, what can I do, preacher? Get it under the blood. And then plead the power of the blood. And plead the finished work of Christ. And tell that devil that's trying to destroy your soul that you don't belong to him. That you've been born again. That you love the Lord Jesus. And then turn to Christ for the strength that you're going to need to deal with that thing. And he will. He can set you free. He can. There's no sin given you. Taken, taken you but such as common to man. God faithful. He'll make a way of escape. And get you out of it. So, here's who's going to help you. And I'll close with this, okay? These are the ones that will help you. A restored Peter. Yes. Old Peter can help you. You know he wrote some books of the Bible, don't you? He denied the Lord, but he wrote the Bible. And he also walked on water. But you see, he wasn't ready to help anybody. Until the Lord said, when thou art, What? converted. That's what he said in Luke 22. I've prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren. Some of you men haven't been converted yet. You can give them words but you can't give them your soul. You see Facebook friends pecking around on a phone you get no soul from it. But when you communicate face to face See, face to face. Did you know that there are people on the, on watching YouTube right now that all they know is pecking around? They don't understand when, 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 I'm, when, I'm, when I say something and I say it in jest or, or you know, I, I, I use a term. I can't, wish I could think of what the term I might use. And, and the man, Van Reckeldurfer, uh, Reckeldurfer, how many of you have ever watched his YouTube? He'll come on there and he'll explain to them what I mean. And they don't know. They're ignorant of it because all they've ever known is a computer. They've lost communication. They don't know face-to-face -face communication. So Peter can help you. Let me tell you who else can help you. It's a woman that washes his feet with her tears. Yeah, with the tears. Tears. When's the last time you prayed? Tears. I'll tell you somebody else. It's those that come early to the tomb. They can help you. Early. They come early to the tomb. Uh, by the way, one of them was Mary, and her name was Mary of Magdala. And that means uh, she was Mary Magdalene, and she had seven what cast out of her? That's exactly right. Those who've really considered themselves also, they spent some time in soul searching. They can help you. Jonah can help you. Jonah can be a big help. Oh, yeah, Jonah. The bars of hell wrapped themselves, seaweed wrapped around him. I can imagine what he looked like when that, when that whale regurgitated him after three days. Bleached white. <laughs> Comes walking out there on the land. Now seaweed hanging off of him. Looked like walking death. And he looked at him and he said, repent! <laughs> and when he got to Nineveh, they did. <laughs> A veteran missionary can help you. Yes, they can. I got a, help. I got a lot of help from Randy Pack, and I still read his Still read his word, his work. He's a, let me tell you something about Randy Pike, folks. He's not only a veteran missionary, well-read man. He's a very intelligent man. And he, uh, he has much wisdom to share with you. If you'd like to read some of his work, uh, he can tell you firsthand what goes on in foreign lands. A veteran pastor can help you. A veteran pastor is one who's been there, been through it. Day in, day out, he's had to deal with the issues. And a veteran evangelist, they can help you. These people can help you. I'd like to think that after the few years I've been in the ministry, that I can somewhere fit in Galatians 6 where it says, Restore such an one. A restorer, that's not easy. It takes patience. It takes love. It takes discernment. you got to stick with it.
if you're going to restore someone. And God help, that's what I want my ministry to be. I'll close with this. There's also the voice of your future. In 1 Kings 19, the Lord said to him, Go return the way to the wilderness of Damascus, when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. <laughs> He's taking your place, Elijah. Elijah said, I'm the only one serving you. The Lord said, I've got 7,000 that have it bowed the knee to Baal. Father, bless your word. People are thinking this morning, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing, Lord. Some of them have let down. They're not praying. They're not reading the Bible. They're not, they're not, they're not making any real effort to get near you. But I pray for them. Oh, God, bless today. Bless your word. Come and do something about it. Elijah, I'm going to meet him. Can't imagine. Can't imagine when I see that man. Elijah. When I see him, I don't think there'll be a dime's worth of difference between him and John the Baptist. Amen. They'll both be dressed the same, essentially look the same. Because both of them came up when Israel needed them. And they were not called forth by man. Father, bless your word. Anybody in this house today need to move? You need to come talk to him? Won't you do it? Is the small, still voice speaking to you? What about that? Still, small voice. No, 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 no. Not in the earthquake, not in the wind, not in the fire, but a still, small voice. Is he talking to you? Is he talking to you? Listen to him. There's no greater friend than the Lord Jesus. If God be for you, who can be against you? That's right. Amen. The greatest friend you ever had. Anybody raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, I want you to pray for me. Pray for me. God bless you. God bless you back here. God bless you over here. Got hands over here. Hands in the back. Hand back here. God bless you. Anybody else? Pray for me, Preacher. God bless you, lady, man. God bless you, sir. God bless you in the back. God bless you over here. Now I pray, God bless you, not as a go-between. There is no such thing. Christ is the only one between you and the Father. But I pray for you as an intercessor. And that's what I do. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, your word has gone forth. I've given them living word. The living word, it's alive within them right now. Heavenly Father, it's, they too may hear the same scripture, but the same scripture does an entirely different thing in two different people. That's your living word. And I pray, Father, you do what you want to do now in the lives of these people who've heard your word. And for those who raise their hand, let your word do what you've sent it forth to do for the purpose you intended. In Jesus' name, Heavenly Father, help them now. And amen. Amen.